and on this computer. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our last lunch and learn of the series. Um, and just like our last ones, um, today's presentation is going to be recorded. So if you know of anyone who couldn't attend this one or any of the past ones, um, these are all going to be on Breakwater's um, YouTube, um, which I have just dropped in the chat for everyone. Just as a reminder, again, um, make sure to put all your questions in the chat as you think of them, and we'll have our Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Hannah, uh, want to take it away? Yeah, uh, thank you again, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, like Danielle said, welcome to the Winnebago Recovers Virtual Lunch and Learn Series, Opioid and Substance Use Response. Um, my name is Hannah. I am the Coalition Coordinator for Breakwater, which is our Winnebago County's Substance Use Prevention Coalition. The purpose of this series is to equip our community with available resources and find, find ways we can work collaboratively and effectively to prevent substance use, ensure access to affordable and timely harm reduction and treatment services, and support a strong and vibrant recovery community. Today, we're here to talk about peer support. The goal of peer support is to help recoverees find and access the resources they feel will be most beneficial to them. Peer support offers something unique to those on their recovery journey. They've been there. They know what a person is going through because they've experienced similar situations. They can understand and empathize, empathize with people in a way that someone who has never experienced addiction can. Their support, respect, and empowerment help people become and stay engaged in the recovery process. And today I am joined with many individuals who are in this realm of work. Um, we have Dan Hawk here, who is a president of the Contract Packaging and Recovery Support Services, and Amy Richards, a peer support specialist, um, supervising EDR Plus Recovery Program and Sober Living, both from Apricity along with Jack Klein, who is a recovery coach and peer special specialist with the Fox Valley PRISM team and is a program coordinator for the Menasha Community Addiction Assistance Program. And finally, Sharon Woodruff, who is a peer recovery support coordinator from Washera Shines. Thank you all for being here today and for our last Lunch and Learn. Dan, can you uh, start off uh, this presentation with really an overview of peer support for us. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. Um, so a couple things when when we talk about peer support, we're we're really talking about the the two models in in recovery coach and then the Wisconsin certified peer specialists. Um, the the curriculum I think most used around recovery coaches is the the CCAR model, the Connecticut Community Addiction. Uh, for recovery services. Typically that curriculum is about 30 hours of, of training and uh, it, it can be done in person or virtual. The, the folks who are going through that training have lived experience, but that lived experience could be as a family member or with substance use themselves. And then the Wisconsin Certified Peer Specialist model is typically 80 hours of training, there's a, a follow-up test and um, to get your certification. And then there's also continuing education credits that are required um, every two years to, to keep that certification. The, the difference there is those, um, those folks as, as CPS have to have the lived experience around mental health or uh, substance use disorder. So it, it can't necessarily be a family member in, in that um, arena. Um, and I think the biggest role that peer support provides is being the, the resource broker, the motivator, cheerleader, advocate. I mean, just helping to connect to, um, helping to, to remove barriers to connect people to what they need. Um, I, peer support, is really about meeting people where they're at and connecting them to what they are looking for. So if, if somebody's looking for treatment, trying to find a way to connect people to that. If somebody's looking for um, clean needles, harm reduction, being a, a resource for that. So it's, it's not really about what we think that the person needs. 
It's about what they need and how can we help them connect to that. Um, one of the things that often gets asked is, is what are the differences between a, a sponsor, a peer support, and a counselor? And so this, this is just kind of broken down um, in a couple of categories, not all of the categories that are different, but in my mind, those, those areas that I felt were, were the, the ones that come up the most. So uh, having that um, the sponsor and, and peer support both often have that experiential knowledge and, and that lived experience where a counselor oftentimes might have some lived experience and, and that's how they end up in that field. But also there's uh, education and training and, and ongoing supervision that, that goes along with that. Um, as far as compensation goes, sponsors typically are unpaid Peer support providers uh, can be paid or unpaid. There are different programs that, that allow for that. The, the ED2 recovery program that Hannah mentioned uh, pays recovery coaches to go into emergency departments and meet with patients after they have an overdose. And so uh, in those cases, people are compensated when they're on call um, and also when they're, they're performing that service. And counselors obviously are, are paid through, through, a, through their organization. Uh, supervision, uh, sponsors don't necessarily have a formal supervision um, and peer support providers are typically meeting with a, a peer support supervisor. So Amy does that for our uh, peer supervisors at, at Apricity and then uh, counselors obviously report to a clinical supervisor. Uh, like I mentioned before about the support framework, the uh, while well, a sponsor typically is going to work in their particular fellowship, whether that's AA or NA, I mean, they're going to have a focus around that. Um, a peer support provider is going to help connect people to the resources that they're looking for or that they need. And, and that might be transportation. Like I mentioned, it might be um, harm reduction, it, it might be finding a job. So it's really about how can we help you move forward in your recovery to, to figure out what's next. Um, and so that, that gets to the, to the next uh, role with the style of helping. Um, both sponsor and peer support, I, I think are, um, I think I have those two switched actually now that I look at them. Uh, Cause I think sponsor and peer support are, are relatively informal. Um, and, and not a ton of structure. I mean, there's a process around goal setting and, and accountability, um, but the counselor position is more that formal strategic planning for what's next and exit strategies and things like that, our discharge strategies, like all of that is, is being worked on from a clinical standpoint. And then uh, as far as documentation goes, like a, a sponsor isn't documenting uh, specific meetings with people, the, the, the sponsee might be doing some notes and, and working through a workbook or, or doing homework and things like that. Uh, and then in a, a peer support, like we are grant funded. So the 82 recovery program does have some required documentation and, and paperwork that has to be filled out to track those meetings with people. Um, and, and then documentation around uh, clinicians obviously is, is required and monitored by their supervisors and, and audited by the state and things like that. So very high level difference between some of those requirements. I, I don't think that there's a, a, a best, you know, best practice or people, people are going to connect differently with all of these different levels of support. And so I think just finding what works best for them uh, gives them the hopefully the best path forward in their own recovery. Thank you, Dan. I'm going to stop um, sharing my screen to make it so we can see everybody's faces. Um, and I really want to hear from our panelists. And Dan, I'm going to start with you and, and Amy. Of um, Can you just explain to us a little bit about yourself um, and about Apricity? Um, and Amy, your experience, um, you know, being a peer support specialist and you're in ED2 recovery. 
Go ahead, Dan, you can start. Okay. Uh, so, like Hannah mentioned, I, I, I'm Dan Hawk with uh, Apricity. I've been with, um, with Apricity since 1998, um, celebrated 24 years uh, in recovery last Tuesday. Um, awesome. And, um, and I think, so I've, I've been in different roles with, uh, with Apricity and one of the, one of my favorite parts about it is that it's very much peer run and peer managed. The staff is in recovery. The operation staff is in recovery. Like people work towards, um, towards things together. So like, you know, that they're as an employer that people are coming in and they don't have to be afraid of, um, they don't have to be afraid of that stigma of starting a new job and, and being fearful of what's going to happen um, within, you know, it, when they're trying to meet new people in uh, uh, at a new place of employment. So Apricity, for those that don't know, um, is a, a merge in 2018 between mooring programs and step industries. So um, Apricity has residential treatment, mooring house in Casa Claire in Appleton for men and women, and then employment that used to be Step Industries, employment in Nina for people in early recovery, as well as uh, three sober living houses in Nina. And then we do the ED2 recovery program that I'll let Amy talk more about. Um, but yeah, so I, I hated the idea of coming to Step Industries and, and working with a bunch of addicts um, because I wasn't really ready to be in recovery. Um, but I, I showed up and understood that um, as much as I didn't think I fit in with this group or didn't want to be here, or didn't belong here, that it was absolutely the right place for me. And so for that reason, I, I stayed. Um, and then I haven't left. I mean, I, I tried, I almost had two other jobs along the way, but something kept me here. And so I, now I'm now I'm here for the long run. Amy? So um, I've been with Apricity for probably about um, eight or nine years. Um, I never really get that right because time stops here. <laughs> um, and um, like Dan, in the beginning, I hated it, but it was the only place that would hire me because of my background. And um, they looked past that and were very non judgmental. And I came to realize I was working with a bunch of people that were exactly like me. And I started going to work with something just kept keeping me here too, because it felt like family, it felt like um, a connection. I, and I got to know, you know, so many different people, so many different walks of life, so many stories. And um, that kept me at a Presidy. And then I, I had a chance to um, get involved with the sober living program. So I became the sober living coordinator there, um, did recovery coach training, um, first, um, and realized with that, that using those recovery coaching skills really helped me connect better to the peers I was working with and they responded differently towards me you know because when there's a power differential people i mean i know a lot of people that struggle with addiction you know have issues with authority and whatnot and being told what to do and um coming in there meeting them on the same level and um just trying to do what's best for them, what it is they want. Um, I found very helpful in communicating in the ways that I had been taught was um, like no other really. Um, 
I took the peer support um, specialist class as well, um, just for extra knowledge. Um, and then uh, the ED2 program started last year where, um, so the state held a grant, Wisconsin Voices of Recovery, um, for the ED2R program. Um, and this program is bringing recovery coaches into the emergency departments when a person overdoses or has issues in relation to opiates or stimulants. So it may not just be an overdose. It could also be they went in there for something else and or they're detoxing or whatever. Um, so um, the, we partnered with Theta Care for this grant and we got it and we started it last year. And within the first year, we were in seven Theta Care hospitals. And um, then from there, we also um, partnered with Ascension um, for their Appleton, Oshkosh, and Chilton Hospital. Um, and uh, I've been training coaches and reaching out to coaches um, just to gain a team of people. So we have people on call 24 seven for this program. So when the hospitals call, we get someone there within the hour to um, help the peer in any way they need guidance or mentorship or just someone to talk to, so. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Jeff, do you mind uh, talking to us, you know, what is Fox Valley Prison Team and, and MCAP and, and really what made you um, want to be a recovery coach and peer specialist? Absolutely. Honored to be here. Um, it's interesting. So I feel I have to give a little, give a little history because um, I haven't found it necessary to abuse any substances since May 1st of 87. So that makes me old physically and in recovery, but it's each day that I'm blessed with that I have the opportunity to be the best version of myself. And I, I don't mean that sarcastically. Um, recovery has brought me many blessings and two of them are to my right, Amy and, and Sharon are like my sisters in recovery. I trust them and I've got the opportunity to work with them. Only Amy's a little closer. Sharon's out in Watoma and Washer County and is a rock star out there. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because I was, I, I got the opportunity to serve on the solutions board for five years back before there was a lot of open minds on the board. And that in itself was a learning curve. And then I tricked Todd to, um, Todd Vandergallen is our executive director, a fellow in recovery and long-term recovery and tricked him to be my vice president. And then when five years I had enough, I needed to move on. And he became the president and took it to the next step. And now Solutions is awesomeness, totally blessed to have a recovery facility in the Oshkosh area that's growing and helping so many people be a safe place for people to go. I mean, that's that, that excites me to no end. You know, we got Gratitude Club, Fond du Lac, we got Genesis in, in Appleton, but near and dear to my heart because I grew up in Menasha, I reside in Fox Crossing, but my recovery started in Oshkosh. And um, I've been blessed to have a support system that is phenomenal. And Amy and Sharon are part of that. Dan too, I know Dan's dad real well. <laughs> but anyway, I discerned being, a, Todd tricked me into getting me on the board of unity because the fact that we all had the same feeling that something was missing. What are we missing in terms of our community and how can we think differently and come up with something because there's barriers and obstacles and cracks and people get stuck in the muck and they don't know where to turn. They have no support and they're, they're kind of left by themselves. And that bothered us. And he tricked me to become on the board. And then he asked me if I want to be a recovery coach. And I took a year to discern and pray about it. And I said, yes, and went through the training in February of 2020 
And then uh, right after that, March 15th, everything shut down because of COVID. So we had a scramble to figure out how we're going to communicate. And Zoom became a priority. I hated it at first, and now I've embraced it. Uh, but it gave us an opportunity to shift gears quite quickly and offer different channels of recovery. And hence, we're sitting here today. We made it through this storm, if you will. But I became a recovery coach because back almost 35 years ago, somebody saw something in me and offered me hope. And that's all they did. And today I know it is unconditional love because they didn't expect anything in return from me just to show up, keep coming back. And it took me a long time to grow up. It really, really did because I, I feel the disease of addiction and or mental health. It, it's, it's, it hits us emotionally. We don't know what to do. We get confused and lost. And, and more importantly, it beats our self-esteem down that we don't think we're worthy. And um, it, it, it offers us um, the support and what we need to start to grow up, if you will, and learn how to identify our feelings and, um, and express them appropriately. But um, so I took the, took the training and I became on fire. We had a 17, 18 people and we were going to rock the world and then COVID happened and it, it really threw us a curveball, but we made it through and then Hoop Jumping 101 came into play in order to be a viable nonprofit. We, Todd had to go through a lot of things, strategic planning and, and the um, leadership initiative. He was kind of guard, guided and then we were issued a, um, um, a, a grant to continue growing. Hence, we have an office. But the reason I became a recovery coach and now a peer specialist is because I need you to continue to learn and to try to be the best version of myself to offer that unconditional love, that support without expectation. And Dan said it so beautifully to be present to people because we're there voluntarily. Well, some of us get paid for what we're doing and some don't, but the individual, it's all voluntary. There's no cost to them. If they're willing, we're willing to walk with them side by side, to go through the muck, to remove obstacles and barriers, sometimes help take away excuses because we all have excuse-itis early in recovery because why we shouldn't do this or rationalization and, and justification, but to truly offer somebody a support as being present versus a sponsor or a counselor. The unique, unique thing is when we ask the appropriate questions and they know we're there because we've got the lived experience, something changes because it goes back on them. If they're willing to make changes, to do something differently, and we find out what their strengths are, what their gifts are, what their talents are, what excites the person, what brings them joy. And then all of a sudden the light bulb goes on. And whether they continue on or not doesn't matter. That day, that time, they saw the promise of freedom from the drug, drudgery of addiction and or mental health issues that had been so stymied for so long because people they don't understand it and ignorance is lack of knowledge. So they don't understand it. So they, they don't deal with it. And that quite frankly is not good. You know, and that's, I'm getting off on a tangent and I'm sorry, I get a little passionate about this, but I, I'm a people person. You can tell I'm a chatty Kathy. I love people. Somebody saw something in me, gave me the promise of freedom from addiction. And here I am today, 68 years old, almost 35 years on a journey and I'm, I'm blessed to have today. And that's my thinking, because it's gotta be simple. Otherwise we turn it into a, a chaotic mess. But anyway, so I'm passionate about it. It takes a special person to realize they've been blessed to have recovery and to take the next step to give it to somebody else without expecting it. That's what makes a good coach and peer support. And I'm honored to be in with EDR. So in reality, Amy's my boss, but she's, she's a sweetheart. Um, and we don't look at each other as bosses, same with Todd, we're, we're people on a journey and it's been working. Thank God we're blessed with this. And you can see in the communities in, in Oshkosh and Winnebago County and other places, it's, it's catching fire. The culture of recovery is alive and well, and we need to embrace it and continue to keep trying and move forward and offer support and freedom to people who are stuck. So anyway, before I go on for another 10 minutes, I'll be quiet. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, did I, you, did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to explain a little bit about um, 
the Fox Valley prison team and maybe even the umbrella term. So you mentioned unity a lot and we'll have Sharon speak here about what Sharon shines. Um, but can we talk about, you know, all the other little pieces of unity and specifically the two that you're a part of? Absolutely. Sorry about that. Like I said, That's I get okay. on a soapbox and it's hard to get me off. But It's good. So it's a, a good soapbox. I'm on a bridge and I keep walking. But anyway, um, well, Unity came as a nonprofit. That's our nonprofit entity and the people doing the work of the Fox Valley PRISM team and PRISM. If I were on task, I'd be able to rattle off what PRISM means. Uh, Peer-based response, information, support, and maintenance. Um, and we had the opportunity to present, present to why Manasha came. PRISM is the people doing the work, whether they're peer supports recovery coaches and doing that most of our volunteers, we now have six people on staff. Um, and somehow the director from Manasha Public Health Department, I'm shifting gears here to MCAP. Um, and they, they saw it as a learning experience for the health department, library, police, fire, and EMS. And it was an honor to be part of that, to help them understand that it could be as simple as handing out a card to call the number for somebody that's struggling. And they embraced it and they applied for a grant and wrote us into the grant and gave us some money and said, go do your thing. And we've been blessed that it's been working. Um, Chief Steich always says, what's the secret sauce? Well, the, the secret sauce is peer to peer, people with lived experience, willing to share their experience, strength and hope with people are struggling and hope that they see an opportunity to better themselves, whether it's in safe environment or employment or just learning to get life skills back and grow emotionally. Um, so Unity has blossomed, it's, it's spreading and the Fox Valley Prison team is growing and can never have enough coaches or peer supports. Um, MCAP is, I'm the program coordinator for MCAP. So they blessed me that with that role um, by default because Mary was and then her dad became ill and they asked me to take it on. And I, technically I'm not a real good computer guy, but they're patient with me and keep teaching me. Amy can attest to that. Um, and it's been a blessing there. I'm just so honored that uh, um, I grew up in Menasha and now I have the opportunity to give back to my community. And seriously, it's reeled me in to say community is where it happens. We don't have to worry about federal government, state government. Eventually, we are going to face that probably on May 3rd. But um, in our community, we can make the biggest difference as people caring enough to share without fear of judgment or repercussion. And uh, MCAP has been a blessing. I, I, they came up with that name and it fits. And um, it's just, it's, it's working to get referrals from them and have that partnership, just like with Apricity. And they're well-rounded because they have their sober living and their uh, treatment facilities and vocational rehabilitation through employment. And we partnered up with Amy and Dan, but I see Amy more. Um, it's just, it's a testament that we can, it's not who we are, it's who we know and the partnerships we create for the end result is to offer support for people that are struggling. Did that, did that make sense? Yes, thank you, Jack. Um, Sharon, will you mind just, um, again, telling a little bit about yourself, um, about what Sharon shines and why you got involved with recovery coaching peer specialist? Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Sharon Woodruff. I'm a certified peer support specialist and the coordinator of our Sharon. I'm not a chatty Kathy like Jack, so <laughs> I'll do my best here. But um, I'm a person in long-term recovery. I'm recovering from alcoholism. Um, I am a graduate of treatment court here in Washer County. And that's probably how I got involved the most is somebody like Jack said, seen something in me that I did not see in myself and asked, to, asked me to participate. The county actually got together and got a grant from Oshkosh Community Foundation to try and do something for the recovery community. And um, my AODA, counselor that is retired now, Sue Smansky. She's my angel. <laughs> and she was an angel for Washer County for many, many years. 
um, she asked me to get involved and say, hey, what can we do for the recovery community in Washera County? Uh, Washera County has a lot of generational substance abuse issues. And my father died of alcoholism. He had a massive heart attack when in the head when he was intoxicated. And my little brother also passed away from alcoholism. And that's pretty much why I said yes, after being an alcoholic myself and seeing so many people and not only my family, but my friends suffer in this world. Um, so I said, yeah, I'll see what I can do to help, you know? Um, and we created Wash Our Shines, <laughs> a recovery community organization. Um, we actually, I got to, together people from AA, NA, any people in recovery that I could find and ask them what, what they wanted. You know, we got them all together in one place and said, okay, what can we do to support you guys? And they said more meetings, a place to hang out, um, you know, sober activities. The hardest part in a small community like Washer County is people, places, and things, especially if you're an alcoholic, because what do people in Wisconsin do? But every social event you go to, there's drinking involved. Doesn't matter what it is. And we have a festival for everything. <laughs> so I we pretty much just created a, a space for people to come and be safe and not have that in their lives or come and talk about their problems. So we just offer uh, a safe place for people to come and get together. We do a lot of social activities. Uh, we have all recovery meetings. Um, I don't know what else. We do a lot of stuff. We do Narcan training. We're actually um, a satellite provider for Vivant Health now. Um, and we're going to open a sober living house. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> and um, when our grant ran out through the county, through Oshkosh Foundation, I had to find a way to keep Washera Shines alive. And I had no idea how to do this myself. So I reached out to other community organized, recovery community organizations. And Todd Vandergallen was the one that stood up and said, I can help you. And that's how we became under Unity's 501c3. So he's our executive director. And I am fortunate enough to work with Jack and Amy and the ED2 recovery program, which is amazing. I just, it, it's great to see somebody, um, you know, when you get to go meet them when they're at their worst and then follow them through as to help them get better, it, it's an amazing feeling. It's, you know, and I seen it with my brother. I had, I was there with him but he didn't survive. So, you know, it, to me, that is just a, a wonderful feeling to see somebody survive and get their life back in, on track. Um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> That's okay. I just want to take a moment to um, thank all four of you for coming here, you know, sharing your, your story and experience and helping other people, you know, and, and seeing, I mean, all four of you were able to resonate that, you know, you, you see a purpose in people. And I think, you know, this entire lunch and learn series that we did is just being able to humanize people. And um, I thank you for all of your work. Um, if anybody here has questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I have a couple of questions and feel free to just unmute yourselves. Um, and answer or take team, however you see best fit. Beth has a question. She's got yeah. her hand raised. Go ahead. Who has her hand raised? Beth? Beth did, but she put it back down. <laughs> oh, I asked her to unmute. Maybe not. Beth, if you have your question, you can 
put it in the chat too. Um, so for a lot of communities, I feel, you know, we're really fortunate in our community, we have a lot of resources, um, but for some communities, recovery coaches are an untapped resource. Um, can we kind of an, expand on that and really try to hit on, you know, the stigma that is associated with, you know, many counties maybe not wanting recovery coaches? It, it sounds, if, go ahead, Dan, go ahead. Okay. So I'll, I'll speak to some of the untapped resources because I think that um, the the treatment and recovery world is is unique because I think a lot of people know like the recovery coaches and peer support know the resources that are there, but the patients clients don't always know what is there and then how to access them. And I think the other part of it in lots of different counties the treatment and recovery boundaries are, are funny. You know, people, people that live in Winnebago County might go to treatment in Outagamie County and vice versa. So sometimes it has to do with what's available when they need it, what's available for treatment when people need it, what, uh, who has a sober living bed open when they need it. So, you know, people could go to Shono, Milwaukee, Nina for treatment or sober living, depending on what's available. So I think that's where the recovery coaches come in, just being aware of all of the different resources in the surrounding counties that they serve can help connect people, you know, that way. Go ahead, Jack, do you wanna to touch on um, that stigma piece? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, I agree because we become resource brokers. It's not so much at that point who we are, it's who we know. And the more partnerships that we form in our communities and other counties and inevitably the state are going to determine, I don't want to say how fast, but when people are ready, they're ready. And if they wait too long, they become unready, if that's a word. And, and I agree with Dan because having the resources out there, knowing what they are to expeditiously get people the help they need. And, you know, in an in a, in a, in instance, you know, Iris House is a short term stay for people, a safe place. We need a bigger Iris House. We need places, a transition place, if whatever you want to call it, um, to help them because how many people that are stuck trying to reach out, trying to better themselves and they don't get the services right away because addict thinking is I want what I want and I want it now. And if you can't get it to them, what do they go back to the old sick familiar way? So being that resource broker, knowing who to contact, hey, got somebody and we'll, we can drive them there. We can do this, we can do that because especially in the rural environments, I mean, look at Watoma out there, Watoma. You know, I used to hunt over there as a kid growing up, but Watoma was Shara County and other counties coming online because they realize the importance of growing the culture of recovery. And I think Apricity has done that so well. And, and Unity and the PRISM team and share, with Shara Shines because the success in our community is gonna be based on the involvement of the people that with lived experience. And I don't care if that's substance use or mental health illness, just sitting down and talking to the two ladies from NAMI that are that, that offer support for families of affected people, as well as um, the, the support for peer to peer because you put people with lived experience and whatever the disorder is in the same room and there's going to be a common bond that common denominator is where have we have the lived experience and that removes a lot of stigma and barrier and they feel that they can be a little bit safe. Tell a person to go to a meeting and don't say anything. What are they gonna do? They're probably gonna say something. You tell them to share their story, they're gonna freak out and say, I'm not gonna say a word. But being that resource broker, being that person to be present to them wherever they are, and it's, it's, it's catching fire, which is a good thing. Now we gotta learn how to do the right thing and continue to bring people on board that, have, that are like-minded. And, and go from there. So th thank you. Yeah, I think it's, it has a lot to do with, I don't know if anybody's ever seen that show, The Anonymous People. That's really good because in our small community, all we had was AA or NA and, you know, people, 
going to meetings in a church basement and nobody's actually talking about it. Nobody's putting it, you know, talking about their addictions or their their problems. And it was all shoved under the rug. And, you know, it happened when I was growing up too. Nobody talked about their father being an alcoholic or, you know, and it takes the recovery community to show the community that we are human, we are okay, and we do recover. It takes us to let our community know that we're not bad people. We're not bad people. We might have a criminal record, but we're not bad people. We have an illness. And I think, I you know, we've trained, um, Amy's trained a couple of recovery coaches for Washera County. And the, the word's getting out there. We have to let them know that we're here and we do recover and we are good citizens in our society and we can help others. And that's, you know, and the word spreading, <laughs> you know, recovery coaching is spreading, but it, it takes the recovery community to show the community that we can do, you know, we do recover. And we fill in the gaps, like Dan said, about the county health department getting overwhelmed and our doctor's offices and there's you know no place for these people to go and the peer support we're here for them when they have nowhere else to go and to get them help thanks that's all i got <laughs> You're welcome. A question in the chat is, I continue to be frustrated with long waiting lists. As Jack said, and I paraphrase, the window of opportunity is only open so far and for a limited time. What is the answer for that? Go ahead, Jack. I forgot how to raise my hand. Technically, I know it's down there somewhere. Um, I think peer support offering that support for them on the journey, offering them a safe or finding a safe place for them until something opens up because you can't just magically build more treatment centers and stuff. I mean, that would be great, but um, it doesn't happen overnight. Everything has to take its course in time. But um, I think more people like-minded with uh, in long-term recovery to offer that support to help them and be present to them through the good, bad, and the ugly until that opportunity is there. Because once we understand we're not alone, that, that removes some of the, the weight, the pressure, the overwhelmingness. Um, you know, when you say to a, a person that's struggling, how can I help you with your recovery today? And they say, well, as long as you don't use me or abuse me. And I'm like, you know, that, that says it right there because you, it tells where they came from. So be a friend. And, and, and be an advocate for people that are in and or seeking recovery. Um, so Jamie, I feel it too, man, it's frustrating, but we are given a certain set of parameters at this point. And the good thing is it's growing. The culture of recovery is growing and more support will come. There's a lot of good people out there. Yes, and I, I mean, um, as a recovery coach or peer support, yes, we're there to um, bridge the gap, but that gap, you never know what's going to happen in that gap. And I, I, I really like the idea of respite care if there was more money out there and housings available and staff to run it. Um, I really do like that idea um, of bringing someone straight from, you know, an overdose or from the hospital to respite care. You can stay here until you get into a treatment center, you know. Thank you. Um, one question I have. So if, if we have somebody on the call right now who is, you know, trying to get connected uh, with peer support specialists or recovery coaches, what what is kind of the first step? You know, is it going to your organization? How can um, somebody on the call today get connected? Sorry. 
So are you asking if they're calling us? Is this like a hypothetical? Yeah. How can somebody's on the call today and wants to get connected with a recovery coach? How can they go about that? Oh, hypothetically, so, no one, no one asked me that in the chat. I'm just asking okay. if anybody does. <laughs> Okay, well, call. The numbers are out there for both Apricity and uh, ED2 and Unity, as well as um, uh, Fox Valley, I should say Fox Valley Prism, Prism team. Uh, give us a call and uh, we will have a conversation. And uh, hopefully through that conversation, find out what level of support is appropriate based on their uh, volunteerism, if that makes sense. Because if they're volunteering to walk um, and have support with a coach or peer support. Um, that's, that's all it takes right there. And we'll ask certain questions to figure out what that level of support is for them and what their pathway of recovery is, not ours. We're not there to fix anybody. We're there to walk with them. Does that answer your question? Do I rattle off my phone number? No, that's good. I just wanted a broad. Um, overview. And as far as, you know, is there any costs associated with it? Um, we talked about the weight, maybe for a recovery coach, but costs associated with the recovery coach? No, nope, it's all voluntary and uh, no charges for that. So, um, and I, I think, I don't know if Amy and Dan have experienced, but 211 is a phenomenal resource out there. And I've gotten to know a few people, especially Tom from 211. And um, ask if we can talk with somebody that's struggling, and they could be here or in a different county. It doesn't matter. Uh, but no, it's it's free service. It's there for them, and with the willingness to change or at least talk about it, then that's their opportunity to reach out and say, "Hey, I need someone to talk to." And you also have the Prism Hotline, Jack. Yeah, that's it. Prism Hotline, sure. <laughs> and I think solutions. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Amy. I'm sorry. And I think solutions too um, is yeah. a drop in site, and they have recovery coaches um, there and available to talk to. Yeah, and most of our most of our people get connected through. We have all recovery meetings. They're um, they usually come in that way. Um, and we, I always introduce them myself and show them around and make sure that they have all the resources they need if they want a recovery coach to work with a recovery coach or a peer support specialist. If they're a newcomer that comes to one of our all recovery meetings and we're offering uh, three a week. So it's pretty good for our small town. <laughs> and I, I talked to a coach at Solutions that they offer childcare now. So a person's able to attend a meeting um, or see their sponsor or take in whatever they need in terms of support. So that's another blessing. Yes. That's awesome. Is that for every meeting, Jack, or specific meetings? Um, I, I was told if they make arrangements, they can do for their meeting to get to meetings to take away that excuse. And if they're seeing a sponsor or a counselor or whatever, because I know dual diagnosis is there, and I don't know what days, if it's Tuesday, Thursday, I forget. Um, but they can make arrangements, just say, okay, I need childcare for these times. Um, so I think it's case by case, if I remember correctly. So but they can call there and ask for childcare for a specific meeting. Yes, I believe that's it. Okay. okay. Thank you. I think too, it's important to mention, and, and this has been brought up a couple of times in, in these lunch and learns, but you know, if, if you connect, um, with say Jack and maybe MCAP's not the right program with you, he can connect you to a share of shines or, you know, people can connect you to solutions. So I think, you know, the important thing is, is, is just starting that one connection who can connect you to, you know, the right fit for you in, in the community. Uh, my last question is, um, and this is for all four of you, um, if you had a magic wand to improve peer support in either our area or across the state, what would you change and what tools would you need to make that a reality? Uh, more resources in the rural areas around Wisconsin for sure, um, as well as um, 
potentially more of those kinds of um, staffed respite centers for people um, trying to get into a treatment program or facility. Um, of course, could always use more coaches, but I think having the resources in all of the rural areas is, is lacking a lot, so. For us, our um, ED2 recovery is funded by state opioid response dollars. So it's limited to opiates or stimulants. So we need funding for alcohol because it's Wisconsin and it's a problem. I alcohol totally killing, agree. Yeah, alcohol is killing lots of people too. I totally agree with that, Dan. Totally agree. Yeah. That would be another wish, big, big, big wish of mine is that we can be meeting with every alcoholic that goes into the hospitals too, you know, that's seeking help, seeking an ear, something. I, I agree, the resources are definitely needed and planting seeds because some people just aren't ready, but just kind of um, nudging my imagination. If I had a magic wand, I would remove the stigma and have uh, substance use and mental health treated like every other disease that's out there to remove that stigma. So then it would open more resources for people to get help uh, expeditiously instead of having to wait so much. But I know we just went through a huge uh, pandemic, which really uh, turned everything on its side. Um, but that would be my thing, remove that stigma, then things would start coming. And in the state of Wisconsin, instead of putting the recovery culture, how do I say this? Instead of the Department of Health and Human Services taking care of it, I'm stealing this phrase from somebody that I know, um, is create a Department of Recovery and have peer support specialists run it. Because I think to me that is the, the people in long-term recovery there's an example, there's a county way up north somewhere, I won't say what it is, but they got a bunch of money and a bunch of people without lived experience ran it. They're in danger of losing their grant because they don't know how to run it. They don't have the peer to peer support. Anyway, that's enough of that. That's politics. Sorry. Okay, I forgot the question. <laughs> All right, I'll read it for you, Sharon. It's if you had a magic wand to improve peer support in either our area or across the state, what would you change and what tools would you need to make that a reality? Um, I agree with Amy is the resources, but um, I guess more, more funding, like they said about alcohol, um, we don't have the funding for that. Um, Funding to get people in treatment. Um, our rural area, we have a hard time getting funding for um, MRT, um, MAT, a medical assistant treatment. Um, I know around here, people can't afford, even if you have a job, your insurance won't pay for Vivitrol shots or um, things like that. So yeah, funding a magic wand. Um, I don't think there is any magic wand, but we all need to work together and keep finding the resources and building our recovery community resources. So we all, just like Breakwater, this is a wonderful organization. I love you guys. You guys are doing a great job <laughs> bringing the, the community together and working together to support each other. On that note, I'm just joking, but uh, Breakwater um, is recording these Lunch and Learns, and uh, this is the end of the series, um, a great ending point for us. Um, Jack says, people are the magic wand. That's an awesome way to end. Um, you can find uh, the series on our YouTube channel, um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you all again for sharing your story and insight. Thank you, Hannah, for doing what you do to bring a smiling, enthusiastic face to this. Keep up the good work. And thank you all, Amy and Sharon and Dan, as well as everybody listening. So thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome. Bye, everybody.